If the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. Fed Chair Jay Powell there on the outlook for rates. Uh, that's a big story, of course, for tracking ahead of the open, half an hour away from the opening bell, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Shanghai. You're watching The China Show. I'm David Inglis. with you Our top stories this morning, stocks and bonds getting a boost after the Fed signals it would meet market expectations with three rate cuts this year. One stock to watch, uh, Tencent doubling stock buybacks to almost $13 billion, even as it posts its slowest revenue growth in a year. And Apple CEO Tim Cook touts China's importance as a market and production base as the iPhone maker faces headwinds in the country. It's a bit of a relief rally, right? We could all breathe a little bit easier here this morning after that Fed meeting, which was highly the marquee event risk of the week. And certainly, this is what you're seeing across markets here, where basically it's buy stocks, buy st treasuries, and sell the dollar. That's why you're seeing this risk rally follow through here in the Asia region. So it was really more about the Fed dots, right, that they maintained three rate cuts for 2024. Marginally speaking, though, we got to talk about the thinness of margins that we're seeing across those dots. But certainly, there is a sense here that this is a dovish sort of commentary that we heard from Jay Powell in that presser as well, saying, look, we're, we're willing to see through that those latest two hot inflation prints. So this is what you're seeing here. Euro is at 109 here. We're still watching dollar yen, though. So despite this dollar weakness, you're still talking about a yen around 150. We've pared back some of the losses, though. There was that Nikkei report talking about maybe what's the next rate hike going to be from the BOJ. Could it be July or October? So maybe it's not just one and done. That's at least helping uh, catch a floor here when it comes to dollar yen. You're watching what, what goes on across treasuries. So uh, we were basically seeing a continued rally when it comes to the short end. We saw the, the two-year downs of about eight basis points here. We're continuing that here uh, in the Asia session. The 10-year is not as, uh, as, as a bit of a rally, though. So we continue to see a bit of a curve flattening here this morning. But Asia stocks are doing quite well. We're up about 1%. Nikkei really helped by that, that weaker yen. Cosby also up. 1%. We're watching those tech gauges like Taipei. We're also up 1.5% at the open. Watching gold very closely. So we hit that record of 2200 after that Fed decision. All, obviously, we've been watching very closely what goes on with Brent as well, continuing that rally here today after we broke above that range that we've seen for, for much some time now. And at least today, we're slightly better with Bitcoin, but we're coming back from a little bit of a steep drop that we saw of late. All right, flip of the boards. Of course, it's all about what goes on in tech, right, and China tech. You take a look at what happened with the NASDAQ Gold and Dragon overnight. We're up close to 2%. you got to thank the likes of Tencent, and you got to thank the likes of PDD. Tencent first, though, so more than doubling that buyback program. Program. That certainly did help overshadow possibly some of the bad news when it comes to weaker gaming sales and the like. And you take a look at what goes on with PDD, 100% revenue growth for that company. It really goes to show Teimu, some of these low, you know, new emergence in the e-commerce space are really starting to take market share uh, from the likes of Alibaba. You take a look when it comes to how futures are set up here in China, though, certainly we're watching very closely what goes on. Uh, when it comes to the China tech space, we're still seeing positivity when it comes to futures here this morning. 229 for your Chinese 10-year yield. So we're still below that 230 level for CGBs and 720 for dollar China, Dave. Yeah, well, speaking of China there, right, 100-day moving average, uh, we're we're looking at that specific level, bulls on board, Hang Seng Index, we're a little bit below that level. We talked about $0.10, cents, so $0.10 cents is going to be very much in focus. I'm looking at initial pricing right now in the pre-auction period, 291 So we, there's a possibility that $0.10 cent actually opens up near the highest level uh, of the year. Yvonne talked about gold. We talked about oil. Gold miners in focus, one group to watch, certainly. And, and of course, inflation numbers out of Hong Kong actually came out... <clears throat> Um, I believe yesterday. There we go. So we'll continue to unpack that. And of course, because of what the Fed did, the HKMA pretty much on hold there as well. We talked about earnings. Uh, just a brief look at some of the big names out today. So earnings reaction, pleasant earnings preview, CNUC, uh, AAC Tech, for example, also coming out with results today. Back to our top story, though, which is the Fed. Arguably, the best outcome for markets, many would say, Fed Chair Jay Powell there, uh, signaling the central bank three rate cuts this year. That's still on course, but it's a higher R squared, as they say, looking further uh, into uh, the future. Have a listen.
believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. It will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. But inflation is still too high. Ongoing progress in bringing it down is not assured. And the path forward is uncertain. You know, we tend to see a little bit stronger, this is in the data, a little bit stronger inflation in the first half of the year. I don't think we really know whether this is a bump on the road or something more. We're looking for data that confirm the kind of low readings that we had last year. My instinct would be that rates will not go back down to the very low levels that we saw. All right, let's bring in Jason Pang now, Asia FX and Race Portfolio Manager at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. He joins us here at Home Call. Jason, always great to have you. So they kept the dots at three cuts, but then they also raised their projections when it comes to growth and inflation. Can we read this as dovish or, or hawkish? I, I think definitively the market definitions of a reaction has been quite dovish. So I would say that it's more in the dovish camp. And uh, as you know, there were also some commentary tweaks on adjustments of potentially the QT programs as well. Mm. Um, so, of course, that would also be considered on the more bullish side. Right. And it's always a circus, right, when <laughs> it, it's Fed Day, particularly when you have updated projections. So apart from the dots and apart from projections moving forward, what else stood out to you there? So I think, broadly speaking, the U.S. economy is still on the stronger side from a service or labor perspective. Yeah. Um, I think, again, from an inflation perspective, um, the jury is still out. But also, if you had to ease, I think the remaining windows to actually cut interest rates is actually narrowing as you move into the U.S. election. Mm -hmm. uh, so within all of those uh, permutations, I would generally say that you know the market has been expecting easing for some time. Um, I think, basically, uh, Powell did deliver what the markets expected. And hence, that's why you see the market reaction mm -hmm. as it is. Um, so how do I position now yeah. around this bond market, particularly in this part of the world? So I think our thesis within the Asia region has been that independent of the Fed, we've generally seen that this year there is, there was uh, already potentially room to ease interest rates. So what I'm saying is even if the Fed didn't ease, some of these Asian central banks would actually go ahead anyways. We've seen that with China. Uh, we had that expectation for, uh, you know, Thailand as well, and to some degree, uh, gradually Korea. But with sort of the green light from the Fed coming that, you know, there are interest rate cuts this year that are coming through, I think that solidifies our view that uh, within Asia, we should be expecting rate cuts uh, rather soon as well in the upcoming MPC cycles. Right. ASEAN stands out to you within ASEAN. Well, ASEAN as a group, just take, take us through the narrative and the thesis there. And within ASEAN, do you favor one over the other? So I think in the post-COVID uh, world, we've seen uh, more fiscal spend uh, across the region here. Uh, within ASEAN, then, uh, we've actually seen that as well. So not only are you getting increased bond supply and interest expense, but at the same time, if you look at what's happened, happening with inflation, um, Thailand being one of the cases where it has actually been negative or deflation, so to speak, uh, and even Malaysia and Indonesia having rather low inflation levels, um, I think the preconditions from an alpha perspective have always been that many of these central banks do have capacity to, to eat. Now, I think the, the difficulty has been that, you know, there's been FX pressures because of short-term interest rate differential uh, versus the U.S. So if the U.S. is able to actually ease the interest rates lower, uh, I think that gives a lot of breathing room uh, for all of these Asian central banks to consider. Right, easing. but they, they won't, though, to the extent we thought about a week back in terms of the Fed uh, eas easing interest rates. So I'm just wondering where, how do you hedge currency exposure, for example, or do you need to? Uh, I think in general we like the duration components, but on FX we've been much more selective, and okay. it is uh, agreed that we actually do hedge some of the selective currencies. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is actually because you have a um, you know uh, negative FX forward point. So when I actually go long certain currencies within Asia, it actually costs us yield to actually go along those currencies. Um, you talk about China, obviously, is doing a completely different thing. Um, it's in, in its in its sort of easing cycle yeah. in some ways. I mean. What do you make of the fact that the CGB rally, I mean, we're, we're getting closer to those record lows, if not there. Can, can it actually go even lower than that, these yields? Oh, so, so disclaimer first is we've been bullish on CGBs for the past two quarters. Okay. Um, so well, we've, we've first, like, congratulations yes. are in order, I guess. You've done very well on that. Yeah. It's made money. It's, it's, it's a happy, happy thing for us. So, um, you know, and, and making money is important, of course. Um, and, and so, yeah, we've had a secular CGB 10-year, 30-year uh, overweight bias uh, over the past uh, six months. So if you ask us again today, um, I think the message really is we do remain constructive. Um, and it's already done a very wide you know, uh, rally over yeah. the past two quarters. 
structures. Um, and I think then from here, uh, I would say that even though we are constructive, we're more in sort of the last mile per se in terms of the rally. Um, so we do expect maybe, for example, CGB 10 year to hit 210 to 215. So, you know, maybe another 10, 15 bips rally from here. Mm. Um, so we are constructive, but uh, again, it's already done a lot already. It's been a great trade. Right. And is that, how, how do you express that? Is it purely just go purely long CGBs? Is there a more nuanced trade there that you guys are looking into? We, we have a lot of uh, rotations that we've done. So we've been sort of going from 30 year back into 10 year. Um, and also we use the policy bank bonds for sometimes when the spreads actually widen. Mm. Um, so we are very active in sort of allocating within that space. I, I guess most recently, given the value creation that we've seen in the 30 year because of the special CGB issuance mm. news, uh, we've actually used that opportunity to um, you know, scale back into the 30 year. Okay. Um, we had an interesting kind of report about these ultra long bonds that and how they're going to sell them, if yeah. it's public or private. I mean, are, are you concerned about the amount of, of supply that could come into this market as well? No, I mean, I, I think, first of all, special CGBs have occurred in the past during the COVID era, so it's, it's nothing too new, if you ask me, from a mechanical perspective. Um, the other thing that I have to remember is onshore deposit rates are indeed very low. So if you're an onshore investor, for you to sort of extract the residual value within the market, the only remaining game in town really is duration extension slash term premium. Yeah. So I think within that context, um, I wouldn't be you know, too, too worried about the absorption of the CGB 30 year. Hmm. Implications on the currency, and I believe what, are you neutral? Uh, uh, we're more neutral or okay. hedged on the sort of FX exposures. So CGBs, you know, we, we run the, the duration, yeah. but on the currency exposure, we tend to hedge it. And again, it's, it's not unique. It's the same issue that we see within all of Asia. All the FX forward points are negative. So again, right, if I, I sort of go along the CNH FX or the CMY FX, mm -hmm. I have to pay, term, uh, pay FX uh, interest. Yeah. Um, so within that regard, I think the message is really the same. We're more hedged, and um, I think across the region, we're very selective on currency investing. Mm -hmm. um, I know you don't cover Japan, but just given this historic move to at least lift rates out of negative territory, does, does it impact what you look at when it comes to, to ASEAN, so, Asia? So we, we do use uh, the yen as a, as a funder sometimes, yeah. and of course then sometimes we are um, secular. Well, we, we think that we are short JGBs to some degree, at least for our portfolios over here. So we have some secular expressions on sort of the longer term monetary. Mm -hmm. Indeed, Japan is improving from an economic perspective. Uh, and I think it's actually worthwhile to note that, again, it's the same with what you see in Korea, Wall and Kospi. The Nikkei can rally, and it doesn't necessarily require a uh, you know, Japanese yen FX exposure. If anything, then if you're actually hedging the yen exposure, you get paid another 3 to 5% range annualized yield. So we think actually, um, again, you know, people are probably long stocks but hedged on the yen. Anything on, I mean, volatility has really come down, right, mm -hmm. in the Treasury market. Do you think that persists or even falls even further now that... I mean, the Fed could not have been clear, mm. in my opinion, really, on what the rest of the year looks like. That could change, obviously. Well, I think that broadly speaking, uh, vol this year, either way, we expect will be lower than last year. Um, so I think that <laughs> <laughs> that's a very that's, low base. Yeah. Well, yes, the yes, it's, it's a positive story. So I think yeah. within this, you know, what does lower vol mean to us is yeah. you want carry components. So we actually have been very constructive on, um, you know, Indian government bonds and Indonesian government bonds. Mm. And also within sort of the credit side of things, you know, we have been building up the carry profile using Macau, um, sort of Indian renewable sectors and others, some of these higher yield sectors. Mm. So we think that the name of this game is indeed to uh, initially at least t uh, capture the declining vol via carry instruments. Jason, thank you so much. Jason Pang there, Asia FX at Rates Portfolio Manager at JP Morgan Asset Management. We briefly touched on the BOJ there with Jason. So uh, the governor is uh, speaking right now. He's in parliament. Governor Kuwait, by the way, to be more specific there. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> is he there? No, yeah, he's there. I, love I mean, I promise you he's there. He's not in shot at the moment. So uh, a couple of lines coming through here. Uh, the inflation target has come within sight. Certainly context, first and foremost, they moved to normalize rates and the question for markets right now, was that one and done or is there more in store? There are upside risks, uh, could have been bigger if they had waited too long, hence the move that we saw this week, the BOJ to continue to firmly support the economy and also uh, inflation. Anything else, Adivan, that you well, see so far? Not so much when it comes to the Japan side of things. I mean, they're, they're, they're trying to at least, and this Nikkei report was quite interesting, right? That they tried to suggest at least speaking to some of the more hawkish economists out there that 
you know, they're eyeing what this path is going to look like. Yeah. And they're actually setting out dates that maybe July, maybe October are, are certainly meetings that we have to be mm. in mind, uh, attuned to, because they could actually still squeeze in another hike before the end of the year. The dovish camp still thinks maybe 2025. But can we actually see one more is another great question, of course. Still ahead, we're talking more about Tencent here, increased shareholder returns. Yeah, that surprise when it comes to the buyback program may help investors look past some of the disappointing earnings. We're going to dig deeper with those results with a rate uh, research shortly. We're also counting down to the opens of trade in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. Looks to be a decent rally here, relief rally across Asia post-Fed. This is The China Show. Good morning. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. We're well, just about in time here for the fix of the day. 709.42. The estimates also bottom of your screen. It's quite a spread. Strength coming through. Dollar weakness really permeating across these markets. Let's turn our attention to tech. Uh, Bloomberg has learned that the U.S. Justice Department is actually poised to sue Apple for antitrust violations that comes perhaps as soon uh, as today, Thursday. And that comes as the CEO, Tim Cook, prepares to open the, con uh, the company's eighth store. Uh, in Shanghai on a trip where he's actually talking about China's importance to the company supply chain. Let's bring in our executive editor for Asia Tech, Peter Elstrom. Uh, Peter, eighth store, but underscore the significance of this trip to China at this point in time for Tim Cook. Well, it's a big deal, uh, of course. Uh, Apple has become one of the most valuable businesses uh, in the world partly because it's been able to bridge this divide between the U.S. and China. That's getting increasingly difficult at this moment. We're seeing Tim Cook make this trip just as we're hearing about more uh, sanctions, more blacklistings from the U.S. against some Chinese companies. So it's a moment of tension. There's also been quite a bit of pressure on the supply chain that Tim Cook himself bu helped build in China for uh, Apple. So he's opening up, as you mentioned, the eighth uh, retail store that they've got there. Uh, he said in an interview with local media that there's no supply chain more important for Apple than China. Uh, its partners make uh, iPhones within the country, many other products too. It's been very, very important to them from a supply standpoint and also from a de demand standpoint. It's been the biggest market outside of the U.S. for Apple, for iPhones and those sorts of products. But that now is coming under pressure. Uh, Huawei, the big Chinese telecom company, has gotten back into the market with some chips that have been quite controversial. It's gaining a lot of market share right now. And what we heard is that in the first uh, six weeks of the year, uh, Apple, uh, Apple sales fell by about 24 percent. So there are signs of tension for Apple on that demand side, in particular in China. Uh, yeah, you, we mentioned about this uh, DOJ set to file this lawsuit uh, against Apple here as soon as Thursday. I mean, can you tell us a bit more about what, what could be in store? Yeah, some of Apple's practices have been quite controversial, especially around their app store. We've seen some private lawsuits where uh, suppliers uh, like the Fortnite provider has, have complained about the kinds of fees that they have to pay within the app store uh, at Apple. They don't like the idea that 30 percent of the revenue will go to the company in most cases. Apple has been in negotiations with some of these uh, companies over these issues, but it remains to be seen whether they're going to be able to push ahead with some of those issues and how exactly it affects the uh, the App Store and some of their, their other ancillary businesses, which have been so important to the profit machine behind Apple. Peter, just to shift gears, and certainly one stock to watch as the, we approach the, the Thursday open in the U.S. is Micron, and just an absolute tearing through the ceiling. The stock use futures are pushing higher. Uh, tell us more about this optimistic guidance coming out of the company here. Yeah, it, it was quite optimistic. Uh, Micron, of course, is one of the biggest memory chip makers in the world. They gave a forecast for the next quarter that was substantially beyond what analysts have been expecting. That's a positive sign because there's been a slump in memory chip demand in particular. Their traditional markets are smartphones and PCs, and for Micron and Samsung and Hynix, kind of the big players in this market, it's been pretty flat. They've been predicting some sort of bottom, at least, and maybe a stabilization. And what Micron's CEO talked about now 
though, is really an increase in demand, largely driven by AI. How does that work exactly? NVIDIA, the biggest chip maker out there, has been pairing its processors with uh, HBM chips, uh, high bandwidth memory chips, that help uh, companies that are training these AI models like OpenAI, ChatGPT, et cetera. And so that is driving demand for Micron right now, and that's seen as a positive sign for the memory chip makers more broadly. Hynix, the Korean company, has been leading in this area. Samsung is playing a little bit of catch up, but there's some optimism now in the memory chip side of the industry that we really haven't seen so far. Peter. Great stuff. Thank you. Peter Elstrom there, our executive editor for Asia Tech, joining us out of Tokyo uh, on Apple, on Micron. Let's talk a little bit more about what Tencent is doing here in the pre-market. And you're seeing, there you go, following what we saw with the ADRs overnight, we're seeing a pop of 2%. So announcement of doubling his buyback, also raising that dividend payout by 42%. That certainly is lifting the mood among Tencent investors today. we got plenty more ahead in terms of futures. This is the setup here right now. So the tech space very much in focus. It looks like could be a good lift here for it comes to the Hang Seng. Uh, we're watching very closely the CGB rally as well. Dollar China, just given the dollar weakness we've seen post-Fed, plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, it is looking to be a good Thursday morning if you are long risk assets and you continue to see the follow through from the Fed, which looked to be a dovish sort of commentary from Jay Powell, the like here. And really what we're seeing uh, when it comes to sentiment across China, you're also seeing signs of a turnaround, right? Dave, you took yeah. a look at this Bank of America Asia fund manager survey that came out yesterday. So yes, it is still the least loved market within the region, but we're seeing a little bit less pessimism when it comes to sentiment, not just from investors, but also mm. consumers, too. Yeah, in incrementally, the, you know, sort of, they have this very cool ratio that they put out, Bank of America, where it's, you know, the percentage of overweight, less underweight. Yes. And certainly that's really come off the low uh, of the day. Still, though, some of the issues remain things like, you know, when you add, and a lot of them say, are still saying we're waiting for more incremental easing. Um, there's a bigger portion that are still looking to sell on the rallies more than thinking this is more sustainable. But we'll unpack this story, and certainly across the spectrum, China's still bottom, but it's getting slightly better, relatively speaking. Uh, we're in the thick of earnings ease and analyst actions, of course, very much front and Yeah, leading there, yeah. is one that we're watching in terms of the consumer space here, cut to neutral at CCB. Wuxi Aptek A shares, that's cut to accumulate mm -hmm. at CLSA. And Tencent Music A shares, that's raised to a buy at Goldman. Their earnings also came out pretty good yesterday, too. Yeah, a big pop in the shares overnight, perhaps a big pop likely today. Tencent in the early goings is now trading at 296, which takes us now to the highest level since the start uh, of the year. Big drop in Xpeng overnight. Big drop we're perhaps seeing. And of course, Geely also out with earnings. A lot of this in store, the open, is next. A higher open. This is Bloomberg. I think there's two ticks today when it comes to the, those risk bulls out there, right? So we got we got through this Fed meeting, which I think it was what markets were wanting to hear, right? The dot plot unchanged, three cuts for 2024, and you know the Jay Powell that seemingly sounded dovish. And then you have the earnings picture in China that's looking a little bit better as well. Take a look at what we're seeing when it comes to Tencent and Kwai Show, PDD. I mean, all these big moves that we're seeing here right now really, see, me, I guess you could say, added up to a pretty good day here today, Dave. Yeah, just about a r nice read across generally tech to your point right and of course we also have micron helping lift the overall tide so that's also a chip story within this chinese equity market and certainly when you have the dovish pivot you know your dollars on offer right now that really also bodes well even further incrementally for some of these sort of long duration growth stocks and you're really seeing that play out here's the open there your benchmarks 1.3 percent and to my point right there we go hs tech 2.1% leading gains right now. CSI 1000 1, and 2000, okay, silently, and some of you might have missed that, there's an extremely strong rally taking place among the sort of broader benchmarks in China, which include a lot of the small caps. So CSI 2000, I believe, is up almost 40% uh, from the bottom. The 10-year yield, we'll talk more about the story on perhaps the, 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 the ultra-long uh, 
government bonds might be issued to public auctions. More on that in a moment. There, our previous guest, Jason Pang, as we changed the board, previously said when you look at the 10 year, they see it at 2.1, 2.15. So easily we take out record lows. 10 cent out of the gates, we're flirting with 300 bucks, 3% up the open. Xpong is down. Jinko Solar also out with earnings the opposite way. Three tens at one percent. So these are actually big decliners in the U.S. session overnight. We'll talk more about Geely in just a moment. Two percent. That's also an earning story. We talked about gold at a record high. A lot of the gold miners traded in China. We're looking at it very closely. AAC Tech is coming out with earnings, and also Kwai shows also an earnings story. And check that out. Four and a half percent, Yvonne, to the upside. But yeah, we're still focusing on tech, and of course, Tencent, that very big one, three hundred bucks, very much. Uh, in play perhaps today. Yeah, certainly is sort of what we're watching when it comes mm. to Tencent and you know after those earnings numbers it, it really was more about the buyback program. I think that's what people are really most excited about. That's why you're seeing 3% gains right now and I believe you said it's the highest level that we've seen this year yep. uh, for Tencent. Let's bring in Sean Yang, Senior Research Analyst at Arete Research. He joins us now. Uh, you know, overall the read was seems like you know, the gaming business is still looking a bit weak, but at least we're seeing shareholder returns. Uh, is that, you know, what's your overall take of these earnings, Sean? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that the gaming is a little bit weak. Um, I think if you look at their gaming pipeline, it seems that the fourth quarter and uh, this quarter, just first quarter, seems that they don't have very strong uh, new games. Most of their new games will be released, I think, uh, starting from second quarter. Um, and uh, also, I think Tencent, uh, that they have a very important competition with NetEase, uh, something called uh, 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 in, in a, like, uh, a very key like game genre, called like party game genre. And uh, but Tencent didn't do very well in the Chinese New Year promotion. Uh, things like advertising and fintech are okay, doing okay. And the margin are improving because they have some like high margin revenue contributions. I think, yeah, I think investors are more excited about this buy buyback plan. So um, so overall, I think that's the uh, results. Uh, uh, I think it's, 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 it's okay, but I do have some concerns about the slowdown of gaming, uh, of gaming businesses. Oh, okay, well, I was going to ask you about the buyback. So, but let, let's talk about gaming. My understanding is you think the gaming unit of Tencent, you're expecting a restructuring of that. Uh, can you just explain what that means and perhaps what's in store for us if they do go that route? Yeah, I think one of the very important things that we found that uh, in China's gaming market is that the uh, market is getting more mature uh, and the players have high demands for some like uh, really like uh, more like niche uh, type of games. Uh, so nowadays I think that it's, it's very difficult to understand, it's, it's getting uh, increasingly difficult to understand the play, player's demand. And if you look at Tencent, that they definitely have, still have the large market share. They have like One of King and Peace, uh, uh, Peace Elite Keeper, these like uh, hit titles. But again, I think they are facing a lot of challenges of, uh, and uh, 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 that's the first uh, thing. And the second thing, I think Tencent's like whole game development is more top down. So I think that high level management have more like, you know, basically uh, directing like what type of games develop, develop. Whereas a lot of their competitors that NetEase is like uh, bottom up. So which means that their NetEase, like each game studio has more like power to decide what type of game to decide to, to, to develop. But in, uh, under the current situation, I think that this is a market more uh, emphasize on innovation uh, content. So I think that's that puts uh, I think Tencent's like a gaming business under some, some kinds of like more uh, like structural challenge. I would like to call that. So that's why I think that probably that Tencent should give like more freedom to its like uh, uh, each uh, duty studio and also designers. Shaw, what about? Maybe the next growth driver, which could be videos, mm. right? I mean, how quickly can Tencent ramp up its video accounts? And how do you think it's going to fare against competition with Douyin, with, with Kuaishou? I think that actually doing okay. I think that my understanding is that the user, the, 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 the time span uh, have all been growing uh, within like WeChat video accounts. I think part of the reason is that Douyin is getting very commercialized, which is that too much ad loads. Uh, uh, and also uh, that Tencent's video account is very easy for users to share. Uh, but I think the problem challenge more comes from the monetization end because, you know, uh, Tencent is a company is more like product driven. 
which means that they don't really want to have a lot of like people intervening into the whole ecosystem. Like how to like you know, do like e-commerce and how to do advertising, but this kind of business is really requ requires a lot of you know underground experience. Uh, I think that's something Tencent lack of. So uh, I think current uh, at this current stage, we do expect that uh, video account is going to see taking more share in terms of user and user time spent. But it's definitely uh, facing more challenging in terms of like e-commerce, GIV, and uh, also like monetization. But I do have like long-term confidence. I think uh, that's the first rule in the net space, right? You have the user, you have the user time spent. The next thing is monetization, but you need to, to have some time to catch up. Uh, Sean, in the early goings, volumes are surging in ten, uh, for Tencent. We're now highest since January the 4th. You mentioned the buyback is a good thing. I guess let me just challenge it a little bit. Do you think it, do you think it should be a concern that Tencent cannot find a better use for this money except give it out to shareholders? Or is it net net a good thing that they're dishing, dishing the money out to shareholders? Well, I think if we look at the cross China internet companies, that's definitely something that's uh, probably that it's a dilemma for a lot of Chinese internet companies. For example, if you do not do like, uh, like overseas expansion very aggressively, or if you, uh, or, or like if you uh, don't do like AI very aggressively, then probably that you can't find very good like uh, investment opportunity. But I think that's something also like like a lot of internet China internet companies are now taking more like or probably for uh, investor friendly like stance. Uh, so, uh, but I, I I think that's that's something that. Um, uh, 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 probably that uh, that is happening now, but I can't uh, uh, say that it's going to uh, happen forever because probably in the future that you know those those companies will probably change their mind, and uh, if they want to do, for example, more expansion in high tech, in AI, international like expansion, probably that they will also like shift this money to future investments. Okay, well, how does Tencent fare in the rest of your? your coverage of Asia Tech, Sean, because you had an interesting report talking about the changing of the guard between Tencent and Alibaba. Can you walk us through that sort of call? Uh, well, I, I think that's the, uh, the, the I think that the tricky tricky part is that I, I'm still very like have long term confidence to Tencent, but I'm just uh, trying to like cut my estimation a little bit, mainly because of the gaming slowdown recently. But I don't think it's going to like uh, last for a very long time because I think after the second quarter, my guess is that because there will be you know some like summertime and they have like some new games and this thing uh, could. Uh, be changed, and on the other hand, that you know, Tencent has best uh, has a very very good like management. So I think that the if that they continue to feel pressure in gaming, that they probably will speed speed up in like a video account monetization, something like that. Uh, and I think I think that's that's more like you know just a, something like uh, I, I would say that I'm have definitely have like long term port view to Tencent, but I'm trying to you know just adjust my estimation a little bit. That's the like key point of the report. Yeah, so that's the Tencent Alibaba co comparison. Uh, I want to take a step back because we've talked about that rivalry for many years, and now the other rivalry that's emerging is, you know, the old generation of Chinese tech, Alibaba and Tencent. Against, we talked about Kuai Shao, even throwing Pinduoduo with those yeah. results overnight. Who do you think wins out, Sean? The old guard or this new generation of Chinese tech firms? <laughs> well, that's, you, 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 you want to put that this is like on the opposite side, but on the other hand, that's, you know, Tencent also <laughs> investing in Alibaba, right? Uh, and also there's more like cooperation between Tencent and Alibaba. Actually, Alibaba has been the one of the key advertisers to Tencent last year. So I, I think I would say that um, probably that's across my space, that's uh, my topic is still like picking to and that is, and um, that is its old company, but it's still like, you know, just have you know uh, more like cu a customer to the new like gaming uh, development. That's a very good story. Even old companies could still have like new growing opportunity. Uh, for PDD, I, Pinduoduo, I think that's one of the key drivers. Still about you know Timu and all the overseas business. Where's the up and down? For example, I would say that the first recently it's more like down on the down circle because of the regulation, because of their cross regional expansion in Europe, and because their new like. Uh, 
business model, semi-management, probably will see some challenge. But I do have like confidence to PDD's like you know unique, uh, uh, like competitive advantage in domestic market and overseas market. So yeah, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's like more for old versus new. I would say more it's like indiv whether individual company could really deliver the results. Right. Yeah, we're playing the TV game here. <laughs> Sean, thank you so much for playing yeah. along. Uh, his price yeah. target there for ten cent three three fifty five a popper at three hundred. Sean Yang, there, senior research analyst at Red Tape Research. We'll leave you to look at markets. About eleven minutes into the session, we're doing well. This is Bloomberg. Okay, checking Gilly shares here right now. We're seeing an upside about 2% on the back of those earnings. It was a beat and reiterated its outlook for further sales growth this year, despite a slowing Chinese car market. For more or less, bringing our Asia transport reporter, Linda Liu, joining us now on, on those earnings. What stood out to you? I think uh, record sales uh, also... Um, essentially surprising analysts because everybody had been so downbeat on the China auto market. So the fact that um, the profit beat estimates as well as the revenues really suggest that Geely is uh, putting in some good work. They've got popular products that um, customers are liking. So yeah, analysts were pretty positive about Geely now. Well, yeah, that brings us into that PC put out yesterday. Talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> the zombies. The zombies, yeah. <laughs> Who are these three zombies and why are they important? And why are they bad? Why are we talking about them again? Yeah, it's uh, really funny to see these uh, long bygone brands that people aren't mm. even buying anymore. They're not even aware of these. These were very small EV makers mm. that uh, started during the heyday of China's subsidy push for electric vehicles. There's one called Zhidou. Um, they're coming back with the help of Geely as well as another uh, motorcycle manufacturer. Um, they said they're gonna, they've started uh, production and then they're gonna put out a new model in April. And another one is, uh, has been taken over by an entity backed by Jinzhou government. So all of these are happening at the same time that China is pushing new productive forces, uh, of which electric vehicle industry seems to be one of these forces. I, I love how you call them the, the zombies have resurrected <laughs> at a time when things are also looking a little bit too much capacity or over capacity. Well, right? one, of, one of the models is aptly named Rainbow, isn't it? <laughs> Judo Rainbow that's coming. Well, are, are these formidable forces to, 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 to contend with, really? Not it's likely. It's a crowded space, too, right? Yeah, to it's yeah. very crowded. We, uh, it seems a very risky, beat, uh, risky move mm. to bring these uh, mm. long gone uh, brands back into the market when you know consumers are already not spending a lot and growth is slowing. So in the end, it may just happen that these will end up being a drag on municipal finances on some of these governments that are deciding to get into this new productive forces rush. Okay, it sounds similar to property a few years back. Linda, thank you so much. Linda Liu, our Asia transport reporter from, from EVs. We're turning our attention to really outperformance that we're seeing across these oil majors. Might not be, might not even have another leg uh, when you look at how they've done so far. This is what, uh, this is over the last month or so. I mean, on this basis, it seems like they've done just about enough and equal. Uh, it might be losing momentum, though, when you look at MCI Energy Index and after the broader benchmarks for the first two months uh, of this year. Uh, let's bring in Charlotte Yang with us to talk us through this. Why will the outperformance not likely last? Yeah, so, you know, uh, these oil, like large oil companies that were investors, like among their favorites in the early two months of this year because, you know, they have high dividend, mm. yeah, and they are considered the defensive state place. And they're now looking like they're losing some charm because as risk sentiment improves for the broader China market and with more flows into those, you know, new renewable energy names and those growth stocks. With, uh, so, like, our latest um, taking to stock column took a look at these. And we think that, you know, these stocks might be losing uh, more momentum going ahead because also because in the volatility in the crude prices, with some analysts are saying that they, they don't see that much, you know, positive colors going forward, might also create some risk for these earnings, you know, for the largest, um, you know, oil companies such as Cenuc. And what could actually take over that leadership then? 
Yeah, I think at the moment we're still watching, but um, as you see with trading earlier, we had the solar names, a lot of the battery names rebounding a lot. And now with some of the, you know, internet name that was uh, pre, the, the, val the valuations were cheap, such as JD.com also had good earnings, they've also rebounded and also those gains have lasted. Mm. So um, I think the internet space as well as the renewable space is what we've been uh, keeping very close eye on. A lot of other big movers today, so we talked about Tencent. Geely, we just talked about mm -hmm. their uh, Xbox also moving. So, what else is what else are you guys going to be busy with today? I think today is definitely the tax space is definitely in the watch. I mean, the, the the early actions on Tencent is quite a bit muted, mm -hmm. uh, but um, but I think what's really surprised a lot of people this or like a positive science investors is the increasing shareholder returns and the company's emphasis on that because we see with Tencent they're talking about doubling the buyback amount this year mm -hmm. and also following you know uh, before we had Alibaba and NetEase and also some big names. Let's onshore as well. And I think part of that is, you know, the companies themselves focusing more on this and also with Chinese stock regulators this year calling about you need to boost those returns for the small investors. All right, Charlotte. Thank you, Charlotte Yang there, our Asia equities reporter on what's really moving these markets here. Of course, we're still watching that tech space very closely, of course, and what happens uh, with some of these energy stocks. Uh, let's get to some news now. President Biden saying a $20 billion award to Intel shows his support of U.S. industries that have withered under Donald Trump's tenure. Speaking in Phoenix, Biden says the award will support 10,000 manufacturing jobs. Now, Biden is touting government spending as part of its swing state blitz as he heads into an election rematch with Trump in November. The bottom line, I want to build a future in America. My predecessor can let the future be built in China and other countries, not America. We're tracking shares in discount store chain operator Trial Holdings opening higher, quite higher there in its Tokyo debut, up from 42% right now. Its IPO raised $256 million with shares sold at the top of the range, the largest listing in Japan since October. Trial's listing comes as investors flock to Japanese stocks on improving shareholder returns and corporate profits. Reddit is pricing its IPO at the top of its market at range at $34 per share. In a statement, the social media platform says it sold 22 million shares. That values the company at $5.4 billion. That's down from $10 billion in the initial round back in 2021 when Reddit first launched its IPO plan. Yeah, and you can hear more about what they plan to do with that money and the platform's IPO and the listing with the firm's COO, Jen Wong. Uh, joins us at these times, so closer to midnight if you're watching out of the Asia Pacific, Hong Kong in particular, and of course 11.30 in the morning if you're watching out of the East Coast. There we go. All right, 20 minutes into the opening bell of cash markets here. We're coming off a little bit uh, in terms of price on highs, but still, it's a good day to be long these markets, equities at least. This is Bloomberg. I think this is a signal, and the market is taking it as that, that they will tolerate slightly higher inflation for longer. The threshold to cut rates is a little higher than many people thought, but also they're not talking about raising rates, even though they've had this higher inflation. I think this is a Fed that really wants that soft landing to continue. They also are not willing to you know, raise rates again, and I think that's important too. So we still think we're gonna cut rates this year. Timing's uncertain, and he, you know, he said over and over again, it depends on the data. It's really much closer to uh, a two-cut scenario, but they didn't go with that at all, and neither did the, neither did the market narrative. And the Fed's still committed to trying to get inflation down to 2%. But I think what's, what's driving Powell is the fact that he thinks that monetary policy is restricted. There we go. Some of our guests on the Fed maintaining its outlook for three rate cuts this year. So we're just over the hump there of what used to be and what could have been what uh, could have been the the first cut of the year. But obviously it's... That quickly faded. That did yeah. happen. <laughs> Where the cut happened, though, was in the BOJ. Oh. Looking at price action. <laughs> there we go. Uh, we're looking at U.S. futures, as you can see. So the dollar is softer, in the, I guess, in the iteration today. At, you look at your screens, it's really in terms of dollar China. Your two-year yield, uh, 250, 458 uh, right now. Uh, TIEX futures. Okay, anyway, there we go. Uh, let's have a look at other movers across these markets. Uh, Tencent, of course, very much in focus. We're coming off highs of the day. That's an earnings story, buyback story, even more so. Kwai Show and Jili Ditto uh, on both of those. Pop Mart, well. that's yes. the one that's popping. Um, this is the toy 
wholesale company in China. So we're seeing a surge, a big move. A Jeffries upgrading that stock to a buy, citing strong momentum and monetization opportunities and intellectual property as well. So certainly that's one to watch here today. And we're watching, of course, these China benchmarks. Um, yeah, so we're seeing we're off some of the highs, as you mentioned, but we're still seeing a pretty decent day across risk assets across the board. We talked about the tech earnings. So earnings has always been sort of that hurdle to kind of get momentum back into this market. And then you add the Fed discussion in there. And really those two things really helping overall the Hang Seng charge up to close to 2% gains here right now. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I mean, MSCA China and also, by the way, when you look at the CSI 300, right, a quarter one percent there's really been a lot of momentum coming through into this market the last I would say seven or eight days have you know, some of the technicals have been showing maybe some signs of consolidation but that said there's really some tailwind coming through momentum has remained strong and it seems like uh, we're, we're still waiting for the next catalyst as far as the 300 is concerned we look at the 2000 we're up 40% as I mentioning earlier. The rest of the day looks like this. So uh, we're back above the HSI 100 day moving average. Of course, this uh, Tim Cook in Shanghai, new Apple store, eighth one in Shanghai. And of course, we're also looking ahead to inflation numbers coming out. My mistake to correct myself, we are coming uh, into an inflation report today out of Hong Kong. A read of 2%, above 2% is what these forecasts are telling us. There yep. we go. And we still got, what, three more inflation prints until June? That's certainly where yeah. we might see the first cut from the Fed. That's at least what the market is tilting more might. towards. With a little yeah. bit more confidence post-Fed. There you go. GMM, mostly green across the board. You're watching The China Show. Welcome back to the China Show. Hour two, we're half hour into the session in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. And yes. Wow. Ah, breathe. Look at that. We're doing quite well. <laughs> Thank you, Jay Powell. <laughs> Thank you, Tencent and Tech Earnings, yeah. right? That certainly is why the stars seem to be aligning for why we're seeing 2% gains across the board when it comes to Hong Kong. HS Tech is up 2%. CSI 300, not as well, but still, we're in the green, Dave. Yeah, I mean, it's the stars have aligned quite nicely. Uh, really looking at markets today, and in fact, it's playing out in Japan where really they hike, but did they cut? Uh, <laughs> the Nikkei 225 is actually now, I'm just checking my statistics to get this correctly. I think we are at a new record here at the Nikkei 225, thereabouts. They're $40,050 yen, and we, 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 were talking, we were talking about earlier on, uh, Governor Ueda was at Parliament and just discussing really that the risk was to them and why they decided to move yesterday was if they waited longer they would have built up some risk so at least that's out the door and as you can see this broad based rally the bulls are out just about across the board in terms of breath in the region here US futures are doing this and certainly you want to consider is that big move up in Micron in the after hours trade dollar is softer we were up I think 18 percent as far as Micron's concerned, so expect that to play out at the open today among the other stocks we're tracking. Yeah. The Treasury curve is looking like this big drop overnight. I think we're still seeing a drop today. Yeah, I mean, you see record there highs on the S&P and NASDAQ. You're, you're seeing a bit across Treasuries here. So, yeah, you are feeling that relief rally because it sounded that there, there was that eagerness from the Fed to ease. According to Stan Chart, Stephen Englander, he said, yeah. look, yes, they put three dots and they kept those three dots in there. So certainly that's good for risk. But even after the first cut in June, according to Stan Chart, they're still keeping four rate cuts this year. They could squeeze in three more in the back half, he says. Yeah, he actually thinks that May, although May is not their base case, yeah. they still could sneak in one in May, depending on what that in inflation print looks like. Uh, dollar on offer, as you can see on your screens, the year is trading at 109. Cable just below 130. In case you missed it, by the way, big drop in, in, in UK inflation and also inflation in Canada. So I guess... The other story we need to talk about is what happens if inflation is sticking to the U.S. but continues to fall uh, across the board, maybe ex-United States. Well, let's hear from the Fed chair, of course. Uh, he did speak overnight. They signal three rate cuts are likely still this year. Take a look. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. It will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. But inflation is still too high. Ongoing progress in bringing it down is not assured, and the path forward is uncertain. 
you know, we tend to see a little bit stronger, this is in the data, a little bit stronger inflation in the first half of the year. I don't think we really know whether this is a bump on the road or something more. We're looking for data that confirm the kind of low readings that we had last year. My instinct would be that rates will not go back down to the very low levels that we saw. Yeah, a little bit of for everyone, right? Right When you keep the dots at three cuts, but then you're raising projections for growth, I think they're talking about, what, 2.1% economic yeah. growth, which is quite a bit of a, a, a surprise there, and core inflation. You know, is, is this really as dovish as people are, are interpreting it? Yeah, right it was, I think 2% is their forecast for core inflation in 2026. Yeah. So it's really certainly higher for longer. And R, R squared, of course, the neutral is... Maybe higher. Slightly. Yeah. There was a slight pickup. Yeah. I think we have a chart of that, which we'll show you guys uh, in just a moment. What does it mean, though, for investment strategy? Yeah, let's bring in Nitsa Nip, head of fixed income research Asia at UBP. So maintaining those dots at three, does it change, if, if anything, your investment decisions here moving forward? Well, basically, you see that I think most important, the message, again, we confirm that uh, rates have peaked. I think that's a very important message. And basically, we still reckon that they are going to cut, you know, um, not before the end of the second quarter, meaning June is still, you know, likely to have a cut. Um, basically, we think that like two to three years, uh, two to three cuts, you know, would um, be likely scenario um, for this year. Um, it doesn't really change much on our investment strategy in a way that we still prefer three to five years in terms of duration. The main reason would be you see the market reaction to 10 years. Yesterday was around like what, 4.32. Now it's like 4.27. Doesn't really move that much. But the short end actually moved, you know, a little bit lot more because mm. again, Fed emphasized on they will cut this year. Yeah. So I guess, you know, our strategy will be try to avoid the longer end. Mm. We still reckon the 10 years will be trading between 4 to 4.5. So, you know, shorter duration, talking about like more during three to five years, we still we reckon with this sweet spot. What, what, what do you reckon the level on the two-year yield should be if, if, they, if they cut in June? Well, think about this way. Um, last year, the two years is around like, what, 5.2? At the moment, it's around like, um, you know, 4.6, somewhere around that. So that means that already built in around like 60 basis points. So in a way, I think it's most important would be when they start the cut, they will, you know, have a look at what the forecast they are, you know, coming in. Mm. If people are forecasting next year would be another 50, 75, we don't know yet, okay? So it could, you know, come down according to what the market forecast. So it could be somewhere around like, you know, 4.2, 4.5, but we don't know yet because it's all data dependent. Okay. And the fact that as we talk about core inflation targets were raised to 2.6% this year, I mean, does this suggest that maybe the Fed is willing to, and very well could cut rates mm. even if core inflation is elevated. Mm. I think they look at different factors, right? Like they also mentioned that they look at inflation, they look at like, you know, labor market, they look at other economic data. So I guess, you know, it's all data dependent. Inflation was one of them, but not, you know, the only one of them. Mm. Right. So they could, they could cut even if inflation remains at these levels. I would in your reckon, view. you know, they will look at the different, you know, issues on hand, not okay. just inflation. He said he is confident that inflation would back to 2% target. Mm. So we trust them, right? So um, yeah. in a way, we reckon that there will be other factors that he will look into. Okay. Okay. Um, how does it affect the Asia IG credit space? I mean, do you think this could finally push up the primary market volumes? Um, we reckon that basically, um, first of all, I think, you know, supply is still sort of very manageable in the Asia credit space. So um, IG credit, I don't particularly think, you know, they are in a rush really, you know, to issue. A lot of them have different channels of refinancing. They can go for the loan for, you know, the bank loans refinancing as well, domestic market. So in a way, I think, you know, um, the supply would still be manageable. Demand is strong, to be honest. I mean, we see inflows into the Asia credit IG space as well, because um, if the US dollar is not as strong as before, they reckon that Asia would benefit definitely. So in the Asia, Asia IG space, we reckon that, you know, it's still a very good place to pack the money. How much further could spreads tighten? They're extremely mm. tight. Yes, already. I know. But I mean, it's about like demand and supply. At the same time, um, you know, we reckon that um, credit spread are pretty resilient because of the strong demand for fixed income. Mm. Um, it's hard to say, you know, it would tighten substantially from here, but what's the factor for it to widening? Unless, you know, we see that really negative headlines, right. maybe, you know, 
some impact from U.S. election, but you know it's still well, almost close to the end of the year. Well, so you, yeah. you mentioned demand and flows. How much flows are you seeing? Do you have a, a rough estimate of how much we're incrementally? I, I would see that you know continuously um, every month there have been um, inflow, um, maybe around at least twenty or fifty million into the emerging market hot currency fund, mm. um, which of course you know it's it's not a stable figure. It varies yeah. depending on the U.S. dollar, but. Mm. Um, the trend seems to be continued at this stage. Mm -hmm. I would and, say. and you're looking at some of these banks, including Japan. Mm. I mean, does the Bank of Japan lifting out of negative territory impact your view at all? Um, no, really. Okay. I think in general, even um, you know, at this stage, um, removing the negative interest rate basically benefit the banks as well. Yeah. The reason that we like it is because um, we're focusing what where the supply would be in the Asian credit space. Japanese banks would be one of them. Mm. In particular, um, um, the senior tier like mm. um, they are yielding still you know, 20 basis points over the U.S. peer, so which we find it pretty attractive as well. The other would be um, 81, but there's only two 81s in the market for Japanese banks. So I think the choices that we can have would be the Japanese banks in general. Aussie banks as well. Yes, correct. I mean, like, you know, um, um, we are trying to ask clients to diversify, not just focus on, you know, Asian banks in general. Are they listening? I'm they do. Okay. Of yeah. <laughs> I think now the clients are basically trying to lock in yield, you know, look for good yield paper. So Australian banks in general, they do have supply, but, you know, it's more manageable. Um, we like particularly the T2 because T2 actually offers some premium over the senior T-like. Yeah. Okay. Anitza, well, I think we haven't talked about China, so we'll get to that, of course, in a moment. <laughs> Anitza Nip, there was stays with us out of UBP. Still ahead here on shows, so 10 cents uh, should be, uh, I think we're up, what, 2.5%? Last we checked. Uh, there we go, 2.3%, a little bit off highs, but still trading near the highest levels of this year. Maybe it's a buyback program after reporting lower than expected revenue, revenue growth, to be more specific. The details shortly. This is Bloomberg. All right, welcome back. You're watching the China Show. A glance at the uh, CGB curve. I look at the long end, of course, just coming up a little bit in terms of yield, and but, but still remaining strong and low, perhaps even lower for even longer. We're hearing right now, and there's a, a briefing taking place out of the NDRC, that's a National uh, Development and Reform uh, Commissioner Council. In any case, of course, Guo Jia Fajan, Wei Yan Hui, to be more exact, there in Mandarin. We're hearing uh, the Vice Finance Minister also speaking. So, uh, effectively, we're looking at public revenue, negative 2.4%, uh, general public spending. And this really goes into certainly this conversation we're about to have on where they plan to tap the bond markets for those ultra-long bonds, uh, up 6.7% year in year. There we go, out of the NDRC. Okay, yeah. uh, let's talk about those ultra-long bonds as well and bring in our Asia Economics and Government Editor, Jill Deesis, here mm -hmm. on how they plan to sell them. That certainly impacts sentiment overall, too. Yes, so this is, I think, a topic of a lot of discussion right now. Remember, these ultra-long uh, sovereign bonds, we've really only seen about four, or this is, I think, the fourth set sale in the last 26 years. And so there's a lot of interest in figuring out where exactly are these going to be sold in the public market, private market. So the latest we're hearing is that um, uh, China is looking to sell these actually on the public market. I think that the, the issue there is that um, there's a higher risk for some liquidity pressure because, of course, if you're selling things to a broader audience there in the public market, um, that means banks are going to have to set aside um, more cash uh, to actually make some of those sales happen. And so that kind of limits the amount of liquidity that's sloshing around in the market there. Um, I think um, at this point, it's just, it's, it's all really interesting because, look, again, these sales aren't incredibly uh, common. Uh, we're very interested in what kind of fiscal stimulus we're actually expecting out of China this year. This is really the big, um, you know, kind of the big, more interesting bit of all of this so far. I mean, are these, are these going to be used to fund infrastructure projects, as we've often seen these types of debt sales um, guided toward before? It sounds like there's still a little bit of a debate over where exactly these projects are, which kinds of projects are actually going to be in. So, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But, yeah, lots of debate here. 
And lots of waiting, it, yes. it, it seems, might be, <laughs> might be prescribed at this moment. So the Bank of America actually released their fund manager survey yesterday. We're going to show that graphic on our screen. So investors are waiting for more stimulus. The percentage of that group waiting for more increased month and month. And it does seem, based on some of state media reports, these guys will have to wait even further. Yes, I think uh, the latest we've heard out of uh, state uh, media, including the Securities Times, is essentially that um, it, it seems policymakers might be entering a sort of wait-and-see period. We just had all of this economic data out of the first couple of months of the year. Obviously, a bit of a noisy period because uh, you're, you're looking at a period that captures the Lunar New Year holiday. Um, but that data was overall surprised to the upside. I mean, we saw a big uptick in um, industrial output. We saw um, you know some, some positive investment figures there. Um, we um, did see, I think, consumption overall was um, maybe not as strong as you would have liked, but still actually um, you know did grow in the first couple of months of the year. And so if you're, uh, you know, Chinese policymakers right now, you're looking at that and saying, actually, the economy is doing pretty well. Um, you know, there's still, I think, a lot of questions over whether it's enough to hit that growth target of around 5% for this year, which, of course, is going to be a bit more difficult to manage because of a, a less favorable base of comparison. But it might just be that, you know, when you, you're dealing with the triple R cut that was handed down last month, you've also saw some of those trims to the loan prime rates. Um, maybe we actually just see how all of this transmits into the economy before we see even more. So yes, I think wait and see mm. seems to be the game that they're playing right now. Yeah, Jill, thank you so much. Jill Desis there, our Asia Econo Economics and Government Editor. We may have spoke too soon because as Jill was saying, <laughs> it's wait and see. The Deputy Governor of the PBOC, he's speaking right now, actually talking about there is room for the triple R to decline, I, I guess stating the situation more than and policy intention more than actual action but yeah i mean we are we know what we're waiting for it's certainly what when that actually comes yeah they have ample monetary policy room they have the room doesn't mean that they're going to do it though yeah. right that certainly is the nuance there yeah. we're back with an it's a nip head of fixed income research mm -hmm. for asia at ubp yeah I mean, should we count on having more stimulus, or at least on the monetary side this year? Well, given um, they are setting the target of GDP to be 5%, um, they would definitely, you know, try to make sure that there would be enough stimulus, you know, for the economy. In particular, I think, you know, for the property market, you know, they would try to have different tools to support it. Um, in general, you know, even though we still, you know, sort of like cautious about the sector, I mean, in particular for the dollar bond, for the Chinese property space, the main reason would be we need to see that the contract to sales to really stable and you know to go up slightly or you know steadily going up before we really think that um, you know problem will be solved so it's it's you know still a cautious stage mm. um, but it doesn't mean that you know um, there's nothing interesting in the Chinese credit in the dollar space we still like the Chinese tag um, some of the tech names DMT names because they are cash rich in you know high IG credits mm. um, which you know will be good for carry play as well I think most important right now would be people need to lock in the yield no matter it's DM credit, Asia credit, I think, you know, for Chinese credit, China tech name, you know, would be one of the things that they can also look What about at. geopolitical tensions, though? Should I worry about well, definitely, that? Well, definitely, definitely. That would create volatility um, for these names. So perhaps the only way to do it would be park your money below five years, which would try to avoid volatility there. Okay. But apart from Chinese tech, I know Macau, for example, has come <laughs> up. Uh, and to be honest, I'm, I'm kind of tired of talking about Macau credit, but it seems to be a well, part of the maybe market. Maybe take that... your pick on it. I mean, when you have CGBs that are close to record lows and yields, yeah. you have LGOVs, which we were talking about yesterday, the China Credit Forum, yeah. that are still showing quite a bit of resilience. Mm. I mean, what, where do you choose, right? Do you, do you focus on the sovereigns? Do you focus on LGFEs or even more in the credit space? Well, given like what the rates environment and the credit environment, I would put on, emphasis on quality credit. So that means, you know, I would go for that really quality, high yeah. IG names. Um, LGRV sometimes, you know, it would be difficult really to go, go through their financials sometimes. Okay, we need to study a lot on the LGRV. Mm -hmm. um, so we also would, you know, look at some of the SOE, um, those strategically important ones. So I guess, you know, there's choices for us, mm -hmm. um, but we need to be selective. Okay, and just your broad view in the CGB rally. How much more do you think? It doesn't look like a yield play at these levels already. No, not yeah. really. Yeah. Um, it really depending on, you know, um, the government, you know, policy on the LPR as well as, you know, how they all just mentioned about like cutting of the triple R, right? So right. I think all these would up, will affect the CGB yield. Mm -hmm. So there could be some space for them, you know, to go lower from here. What's the mood in the offshore bond market overall? You talked about tech. You we mean 
yeah. US dollar um, Chinese credit, yes, right? Yeah. Um, it's still, I think, majority of the investor um, are from the Chinese space. Okay. Um, they are, you know, well supported by um, Chinese investor. Mm. Um, liquidity wise, it's still sort of like you know average, I would say, because I think depending on the credit, as I said, SOE tech names that would be you know good supporter even from foreign investor as well. Um, but if you are talking about really local LGV, um, not too many people, you know, um, sort of have a lot of information about the credit. Yeah. So that's why I think you know people would still prefer those that um, with IG credit rated or SOE. Hong Kong corporates, you're saying you're, you're looking at too oh, the definitely. IG space. I mean, you know, since the beginning of the year, we've seen some rally on some of the Hong Kong IG credits as well. Um, people worry about the interbank funding market that they are, you know, um, um, they are used to have, get their right. loan. But I think even Fed is saying that they're going to cut rate. So we reckon the interbank market in Hong Kong dollar would also sort of, you know, reduce in the pressure. Mm -hmm. So we feel comfortable with that. But again, you know, we just look at the IG names, yeah. those bigger ones. Right. Have any of the the measures that were announced during the Hong Kong budget to ease the, the problems in the property market, has mm -hmm. that has that? Oh, it, ha it has helps it a lot, okay. I would say. It helps a lot in terms of the sentiment for these credits. Right. In particular, um, China also put up, you know, different measures on the property space, right? Mm. So Hong Kong corporate, some of them have projects in China. Mm. So together with the um, measures made by the um, Hong Kong government, it help, helps a lot, you know, on the credit. What are yields there doing? Uh, for the Hong Kong credit? Hong Kong corporates, yeah. Um, talk about Investment like grade. Three, five years um, at the moment around 5.7%. Mm. Um, so it's it's not bad, I would say, because um, most of them are, you know, also have very strong fundamental in terms of IG credit. Yeah. And it's a great to have you. you. Enjoy your holiday as well. And it's a head of fixed income research Asia at UBP. We got plenty more ahead. Mm. This is Bloomberg. Some stories, major stories, we're following from around the world at this point in time. The Vietnamese President Vo Van Thuong has, uh, well, resigned as investigations into the country's top leadership continue to widen. So the Vietnamese parliament is set to vote on his resignation later. Now, a statement from the Communist Party says the president violated party regulations but did not give any further details. The shakeup renews speculation about Vietnam's political succession after the party chief was hospitalized earlier this year. Now, a top U.S. admiral says signs suggest that China is sticking to its ambitions to be ready to invade Taiwan by 2027. The U.S. Indo-Pacific Command's leader, John Aquilino, also told lawmakers that Beijing is building its military and nuclear arsenal on a scale not seen since World War II. He says the PLA's actions indicate their ability to meet President Xi Jinping's preferred timeline for unification. And President Biden says a $20 billion award to Intel shows his support of U.S. industries that were wither, that had withered uh, Donald Trump's tenure. Now, speaking in Phoenix here, Biden says the award will support 10,000 manufacturing jobs. Biden is touting government spending as part of his swing state blitz as he heads into an election rematch with Trump come November. The bottom line, I want to build a future in America. My predecessor and let the future be built in China and other countries, not America. All right, in terms of what we're checking across these markets, it's, uh, yeah, the tech space continues with what we saw with those pretty blow, blowout Micron earnings that came out. So adjusted revenue forecast did beat estimates. AI growth certainly helping with that forecast as well. So you are seeing the likes of Tokyo Electron up some 3%. SMIC is doing quite well. Look at SK Hynix. We're up, <laughs> up about 7% here this morning. And we're taking a look at this IPO, or at least trading debut in Tokyo here today. Trial Holdings, this is the discount store chain operator. They sell everything from fresh food, ready-made meals, houseware, appliances, the like. So trading debut, we're seeing that pop of the shares up close to 40% and the biggest IPO in Japan this year. Yeah, there we go. So we're looking at, so big picture, of course, we're trading, we're looking at these markets. First, obviously, we're in the thick of things. First full day of reaction post-Fed. Uh, we've done a survey. Our MLive team, of course, has put out a survey in what investors are thinking post the Fed, you're looking at U.S. stocks uh, coming off a little bit, will be losing steam, I think, when you compare the, the sort of forecast from before and after uh, that conversation. On the S&P 500, so investors expect the SPX to rise to about 54, 54 at the end of this year from just under 52 to 5 on Wednesday. So that's what's 
imply a sort of deceleration in these gains. Just keep in mind we're up, what, give or take about uh, 10% this year. We were up by a quarter in terms of price in 2023. So it's, it's, it's been good. It's yeah. Been good. There we go. And you wonder what happens with the dollar, right? And yeah. what could actually outperform the dollar this year? And surprisingly, it's the yen. And despite what we've been seeing this week, right, we're just we got out of negative rates and we're talking about yen that's hitting 150, 151. Uh, there's still maybe some room for this yen to continue to rally in some ways. So and in fact, if you take a look at how everything, the votes have been tallied, you know, it's double the amount of what people think when it comes to the euro and the pound. Yeah. So there is quite a bit of conviction there that maybe there's still a bit of catch up there for the end here, too. Yeah, and certainly risk reversals do indicate that positioning is still uh, towards some yen appreciation. It hasn't come just yet, and I guess it's, uh, it's almost having a wrong call. The more wrong you get, uh, the more convincing that, that, that trade then becomes in terms of just the outlook. Uh, stocks versus bonds, relative 55% do think, of course, it's the S&P. There we go, over treasures. Plenty more ahead. All right, 11.29 a.m. in Tokyo. We're heading to that lunch break in Japan. And yeah, it's looking pretty good if you're long stocks here. So it looks like we, we're really kind of brushed off this BOJ meeting and we're resuming this rally here right now. We're up about 1.5% and more on the Nikkei, Dave. Yeah, so non-event on monetary policy, right, which is a good thing. No nasty surprises, no hawkish surprises. Arguably the best outcome really for risk assets out of the Fed. So still three... And we can talk about, the, I guess, how things look further into the future. But that being said, further into the future means perhaps a good economy. Up just about across every single sector, as you can see here on your screens. MSA Asia Pacific, in case you're curious, at these levels, 178 and 41. That's the highest since April 6 of 2022. And with 2% gains, that's the best day so far since November 15, 2023. Aha! I have some numbers here in my head. Okay, there we go. Three tenths of 1% here on S&P Futures. Micron is a story to track very closely. Let's take a step back. Yesterday, BOFA released this closely followed fund manager survey and really consistent with the price action we're seeing here. So we'll take a global look first and foremost. Risk appetite, highest in three years. Allocations, uh, two-year highs. Allocations into EM have actually jumped the most uh, since 2017. This is, of course, Feb against the March survey. We'll zero in on what people's thinking are as it pertains to China. We showed you this earlier on, but let me just recap this, of course. In terms of the percentage of investors who are waiting for more easing signs, that's actually picked up further, which I guess in some ways implies that uh, we're still waiting. You know, we're up 10% in MSCI China, I believe. We're waiting for more catalysts, and we could get them in the form of uh, this earnings uh, season we're in right now. And are you looking to sell on bounces? And as you can see, that percentage has actually uh, come a little bit lower. So there we go, 10%. So just a snapshot, I guess, of the thinking across the investor community. Yeah, Yvonne. a little bit less pessimistic, yeah. according to that Bank of America fund manager survey. For more, let's bring in our Bloomberg Intelligence equity strategist and analyst there, Marvin Chen. Marvin, it, it's rare for us to see a CSI 300 gain for, I think, close to six weeks now. Is this sustainable? Yeah, I mean, we do see room for a tactical rebound in China. Um, you know, uh, this is largely driven by un undemanding valuations, uh, light positioning, and, you know, a turn in the earnings cycle. Uh, the, Fed, uh, the market stabilization measures in February have played an important part in stabilizing sentiment. We are seeing signs of uh, uh, sentiment turning. Uh, we're seeing some rotation into growth sectors, uh, equity inflows. Um, and, you know, the macro data is uh, pointing a little bit better. Inflation's ticking up and the earnings season so far has been a positive surprise so um, you know we are we are quite positive in the near term but uh, you know we do want to highlight that some of the uh, the market cycles in China are becoming shorter and investors need to stay nimble uh, you mentioned about the turning point maybe in the earnings season I mean what, what is your overall takeaway so far yeah, so far we're roughly, you know, 50% through the earnings season. Um, aggregate earnings surprise has come in about 10 to 15% ahead of expectations. Um, and and uh, last quarter's earnings growth is on track to turn positive after a year of recession. So um, also, you know, shareholder buyback, uh, 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 share buybacks, uh, increased dividend payouts have, has been a big theme. Yeah. Um, so we are, uh, the earnings season has been positive, but we want to see this momentum kind of carry over into the first quarter as, you know, 
last year, the first quarter was the first quarter since uh, the full reopening. And, okay, yeah. as far as flows, what are you seeing? Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're set to see two consecutive months of inflows over the northbound Stock Connect. Obviously, the first month uh, of February was driven by kind of the state-owned or national team buying. But, uh, you know, now that the CSI uh, uh, and onshore markets are up, you know, 4 to 5 per, uh, percent year-to-date, we expect some of that support to kind of roll off. But it, So it's encouraging that we see uh, kind of this continued uh, inflows in, in this month. And in terms of sector rotation, allocation, what's worked, and how do you anticipate that to be changing? Yeah, you know, energy has been what has working. Uh, You know, the running joke in onshore markets is that uh, U.S. has NVIDIA lifting markets. China has China Shenhua Coal and the coal miners. Ha. So, so, yeah, so, so, take yeah. that, NVIDIA. <laughs> yeah, so, the, so, you know, the sector has been up 15, 20 yeah. percent year to date. But, yeah. you know, after the MPC where we have uh, highlighted these uh, uh, new productive forces, uh, you know, these include green energy, EVs, uh, tech, and consumer, um, you know, we've seen, we're seeing a rotation into these growth sectors. And these are the sectors that really sit behind, just sit behind um, energy in our sector score card. There we go. Marvin, fantastic work there. Marvin Chen, Bloomberg Intelligence, equity strategy. Um, let's uh, check in on Tencent right now. So we're about an hour into the session here. 2%, give or take. You have a buyback, perhaps more in focus. And of course, uh, some other things which we'll unpack for you in a moment. Off highs of the day. There we go. 294. Some views from our guests earlier on Bloomberg TV. Things like advertising and fintech are okay, doing okay. And the margin are improving because they have some like high margin revenue contributions. But I think, yeah, I think investors are more excited about this buy- buyback plan. So, um, so overall, I think that's the uh, results. Uh, uh, I think it's, 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 it's okay, but I do have some concerns about the slowdown of gaming, uh, of gaming businesses. Other than just looking at the uh, total revenue growth, I think investors should be paying more attention to the gross profit growth, which is essentially double, um, you know, growing at double digit. So this quarter is like 25% mm. year-over-year growth, and it's been re-accelerating over the past few quarters. The main reason is because Tencent has been focusing on the higher quality revenue stream, which to some extent is a net revenue recognition basis, but it's a higher margin. <sighs> Let's bring in Robert Lee and get his take now, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst on Tencent. Um, You're saying they they did not miss the bottom line. Why not? Yeah, I think, first of all, there were a couple. There was some confusion in the market, maybe the odd headline here and there that wasn't quite right, that they'd missed numbers. Um, I think part of the confusion was due to a restatement in the numbers, which sort of washed through at the bottom line. So on the face of it, it appeared they missed numbers. They didn't. So adjusted operating profit was, was ahead, but only by 1% or so, and the same on the bottom line. So I would say, given the margin of error, there are inline numbers. It mm. certainly wasn't a mess. So that was the first thing I've said. And obviously, there's been a lot of attention and commentary on the games today. Games was weaker on the top line. You know, th- that's absolutely uh, a fact. Um, but then we saw upside on the advertising side to the business and also on the fintech, which are a substantially higher p- uh, portion of their revenue. And just to briefly quote a few numbers at you, because I think... If you mention Tencent to people, they think, yes, it's the world's largest gaming company. You know, it's been largely driven by games over recent years. But gaming as a percentage of their revenue has fallen from around 41% in 2017. Based on consensus numbers in the coming year, or this year, I should say, it's down to 29. So gaming is a much smaller part of the business than it used to be. And also, of that 29% of revenue, domestic games is only 17. So yes, the domestic gaming business was weaker on the top line than expected. There are some company-specific issues, which they're, they're changing some management. They're trying to focus more on monetization. They've probably taken a while off the ball there. That, that is a negative. But look at the positives, and I'm trying to give a very level-headed, rational view here. You know, it's the growth drivers in the advertising business which drove 150% beat, oh, sorry, 150% basis point beat at a gross margin yesterday. Mm. So it's those higher margin businesses which have a sustainable growth trajectory which should continue to drive the earnings and the margin improvement of this business through the course of this year. So therefore, from where I'm sitting and the market reaction today, things are actually in line. Do we see the same conditions persist this year? In other words, what's the setup given these numbers? Yes, these are sustainable 
arguably secular trends. I mean, it's the growth in um, short videos, and, and they're obviously capturing share versus Doing and others, and there's a lot of momentum behind that side of the business. I think, as one of your other guests said as well, they're expanding into mini games, which mm. is extremely high margin. It's factors like those with a sort of mixed shift within their revenue towards these higher margin businesses and with underlying gross margin improvement in those, that's what's going to help drive you know, close to 15% earnings growth this year. So I think, as I've said previously, absolutely that doesn't match the Magnificent Seven in terms, you know, 15%, um, you know, people in the US probably wouldn't get out of bed for that sort of growth rate, but Tencent is trading on far lower earnings multiples and valuations. So that, that, that perhaps goes into the buyback story, and, you know, you can look at the two ways. I asked the earlier, our earlier guest the question, you know, the fact that they can't find a better, better uses of this money than to give it back to shareholders. Better uses in quotations, of course. Yeah, no, no sorry. <laughs> um, don't read too much into my facial expressions on that. No, no, it's true. I mean, it's surplus cash. So if I guess they're not an asset-intensive business. Unlike TSMC, they don't need to build a new fab. Mm. It's, it's a people business. It's a mm. service business. But they're inherently very cash generative. And, uh, you know, they're generating good cash at the moment. If there's no alternative use to it, to return it for enhanced dividends or share buybacks is an obvious thing for them to do. Mm. I mean, having said that, I mean, we're, we're seeing a greater focus on shareholder returns and um, within the market, particularly the likes of Alibaba. But again, there's a huge distinction between whatever risks Tencent faces in Alibaba, Alibaba really, you know, has got a somewhat challenged outlook, um, w you know, with the, the impact from competition from low-cost competitors like Timu, etc. Yeah. Tencent's a fundamentally different story. Whilst it's not without risk, it is relatively broadly spread with high barriers to entry and a relatively robust outlook. Yeah, I was going to switch gears and talk a little bit more about this scoop that we had on, on Huawei and, and, and the U.S. looking to add a few more names linked to the company uh, to this blacklist. I mean, what do you make of these you know, reported sort of measures that they could be thinking about to, to ring fence China's tech ambitions? Well, that's it. To ring fence them or wall them off. I mean, it's part of the ongoing containment uh, efforts by the U.S. and, and U.S.-aligned companies in uh, countries, I should say, in Europe or Australia, um, to driven by national security concerns on, on one level, but also, I would say, given the increasing economic rivalry there is between China and the U.S. China is the world's second largest economy. Semiconductors underpin everything in our life, day-to-day -day life, from phones to, you know, you name it. So, um, as, you know, I, I guess from an ep economic threat standpoint, if China is successful in developing uh, its domestic chip industry, um, that's potentially going to cut off potential business from U.S. companies um, and, you know, increase the competitiveness of their overall tech offering yeah. across the board. So there is a national okay. security element, Rob but also the economic element. Robert Lee there, our Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst on just all things Tencent, all things Chinese tech, and also initial take there on Huawei. It's a good day to be an equity investor today. We'll talk more <laughs> about this story. 2.1% best day for Asian equities this year so far. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Here's your China Brief this morning. A look at some of the stories making headlines in papers and online. And really, the big story has been Tim Cook in China, where they've been covering the Apple CEO's visit to Shanghai ahead of its opening of a new store there. The Shanghai Security News reports that, the, that he did meet with executives of the company's top Chinese suppliers. The report says Cook pledged to maintain Apple's close and, quote, win-win partnership with them. Well, same story. In the meantime, though, when you look at the Global Times, uh, they're actually running a story in Cook's comments to local media that there's actually no supply chain more critical to Apple than China. The report also cites experts saying that Apple needs to ramp up efforts to regain lost market share in the country. And this is really going into what's been trending today and some of the reactions across social media. I mean, that, that video, if we can show it, we have him walking around the streets of Shanghai, eating a Xiaolong Bao with, with Zheng Kai. This is the Chinese actor that was part of that really hit show, Blossom Shanghai. That really just goes to show the, this, I guess, the symbolism, too, of how this relationship has been with Apple and China as yeah. well. Reactions on Weibo, I mean, it's been mixed. But some say, look, didn't Apple relocate a lot of the supply chain to India? I don't see how critical China is at all. Another 
persons that say Apple has been following China's rules and is a good model of a multinational company. Yeah. What was that movie of Ethan Hawke? Oh, gosh. And, um, okay, what's your name? Um, three versions, two were in the 90s, one was recently. Um, You're putting me on the Walking spot. around, was it Paris or France? You're putting um, me on the spot. Selling Sunset. Was it, no, not Selling Sunset, sorry. <laughs> selling sunset. That, that, that's more recent. That's before, before sunset, sunset, before Sunrise. There Thank we you, go. Thank you, producer Paolo. The, okay, I'm not saying the two, but the, the overall texture and the vibe of the cinematography I mean, on that video it does very seem well like very produced, Ethan Hawke. I have to yeah. say, right? Yeah. 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 Beautiful movie, by the way. <laughs> and that's a nice bridge. I used to live quite near where, where that was shot in, in Shanghai. Anyway. Anyway. Alan Wong. <laughs> you are selling something. Our senior editor joins us now from Shanghai. He's, he's following all things and tracking where Tim Cook is mm. right now. Alan, just tell us, why do you think Cook's yeah. trip is so important for the Chinese government as it is for Apple? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's important for, for Apple and, uh, and the Chinese government. I mean, for Apple, we know about all these recent challenges, right? It's Jettison, it's decade-long decade -long EV project. It hasn't been doing a lot in terms of generative EI. And most importantly, iPhone sales in China have plunged 24% in the first six weeks of, uh, of this year, according to CounterPoint. So we know about Apple's challenges. And, you know, the reality is they're doubling down in China. And, and for, for, uh, for, for the Chinese government, um, what um, Tim Cook said yesterday was very telling. Tim Cook, uh, he said that uh, basically uh, there's no supply chain more critical uh, than China. And that, that's a vote of confidence at a time when the economy is slowing, multinationals are looking elsewhere for growth, foreign direct investment is plunging, I mean, we're at three lows. Um, so, so basically, it, it's, a, it's a vote of confidence. Um, and um, also, you got to understand that, like you said, a lot of these, um, a lot of operations have been shifting to India, Malaysia, and elsewhere. So it's 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 a way to reassure the Chinese government that uh, Apple is still um, is is, is, to is totally invested in this country, despite all these challenges. And you're you're set to cover this store opening. Uh, later today, of course, in, in the city, Alan. Uh, how excited are you? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I'm always like, you know, I, I enjoy, you know, checking out the latest gadgets. Uh, you know, obviously there'll be some new, uh, maybe some new iPads and Vision Pro and all that. But I mean, more importantly, I want to see where Tim shows up. I mean, we're not even sure whether or not he's going to show up. Mm -hmm. uh, right. More likely than not, uh, he's, he's probably going to be attending the China Development Forum later this week. In Beijing, um, so I want to see whether he, he he comes and he talks about you know China. Uh, also, I want to check out the lines. Whether or not we're gonna have big crowds like mm -hmm. we've seen in the past. And they talked about improving the customer experience. I wonder if they're gonna pull like a Starbucks and have this incredible, uh, monstrous store in the, in the heart of Shanghai. You know, in Shanghai, this is roastery in, in Shanghai, and it's not just a place to enjoy coffee. It's a place to really hang out for hours. So I'm yes. thinking, well, maybe Apple is gonna do something, something similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. An apple roastery. So that's no, that's kind of what I'm looking yeah. for. <laughs> yeah. 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 Isn't that Starbucks store? That's in Jing'an, right? Allen, in yeah. the middle, right? That's the downtown. That's yes. the big one, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's become sort of like a destination in many ways, you know. Alan, I always look forward to your reports when you're in the field. There so I'm go. really looking forward to this one. Alan Wan mm. joining us out of Shanghai mm. ahead of that store opening for Apple in Shanghai, in the city there. For more news on Apple, of course, we're following some other news. The U.S. Justice Department is said to be poised to sue Apple as soon as Thursday for violating antitrust laws. Apple has been accused of blocking rivals from assessing hardware and software features of its iPhone. The DOJ has already sued Google for monopolization, while the FTC is pursuing antitrust cases against Meta and Amazon. Another story we're tracking, J.P. Morgan is said to be planning a leadership reshuffle in China as the country faces increasing economic woes. Sources say it's considering naming its APAC CFO, Alan Ho, as its new China CEO, while Hong Kong dealmaker Rita Chan is said to become senior country officer. They would fill the vacancy left by Mark Leung, who resigned last month after a 25-year stint at the firm. Okay, cross-asset check right now, equities, and then we'll have a look at fixed income a bit later on in the show. But equity markets, as you can see, are on very solid footing uh, today. Volumes are steady in terms of breadth across the region and across sectors. This one is fairly positive. Best day so far on price this year. Highest level in two years on the MSCI Asia Pacific. This is Bloomberg.
All right, why not? More Fed. <laughs> Former New York Fed President Bill Dudley says uh, Jay Powell is actually confident inflation is coming down. He spoke with Bloomberg earlier on the policy outlook. Have a look. I don't think he's changed the story at all. I think what, what people are a little bit flummoxed by is the fact that Fed sees stronger growth, a little bit higher inflation, yet the same number of interest rate cuts uh, penciled in for 2024. I think the, the reality is it almost flipped. I mean, one more person had moved their interest rate forecast up, it would have been two rate cuts since the median rather than three, and people probably would be interpreting this in a, a much more different manner. I think, you know, Paulo's confident about a couple of things. Number one, that inflation is coming down. Uh, number two, that there's a, that the labor supply is increasing, and that's creating slack in the labor market. And three, that monetary policy is tight, and that's why he's confident that eventually he's going to cut rates. It's just a question of timing. Bill, do you think that there's something incompatible about shifting upward a growth target, shifting upward a targeted PCE for the end of the year, and even shifting up just slightly where rates are going to be and saying the story hasn't changed, that the inflation target is still the same, it just might take a lot longer? I think what people, I think, misinterpret is the summer of economic projections is not a Federal Reserve forecast. It's not Powell's forecast. It's a collection of individual forecasts. And the Fed doesn't coordinate the S&P. They're not trying to, you know, go out and, and ask people to write down certain numbers to tell a certain story. It's just a collection of individual forecasts. And as, as we see in this case, you know, one dot moves, you have a slightly different story. <laughs> so I think that Powell's basic message is that the underlying story hasn't changed. We didn't completely buy into how good the inflation numbers were in the second half of next year. We're not completely put off by the bad inflation readings in January and February. We still think monetary policy is tight. We still think we're going to get more confident about getting inflation down to 2%. And so we still think we're going to cut rates this year. Timing is uncertain. And he, you know, he said over and over again, it depends on the data. Though not all dots are created equally. Where do you think Chairman Powell is? on this story right now, because it just seems to me there is a bias to cut interest rates. Steve Rusciuto of Missouri came on this program in the last week or so, and he said this Federal Reserve wants to cut interest rates. Chairman Powell wants to cut interest rates. Is the bias to cut, regardless of what the data looks like? I wouldn't go as far as to say the bias is cut no matter what the data looks like. I mean, the Fed's still convinced to trying to get inflation down to 2%. But I think what's, what's driving Powell is the fact that he thinks that monetary policy is restrictive. So if you, if you stay at the current setting, the economy will gradually slow, and that will set the stage for less strength in the labor market, which will then motivate cutting, cut, cutting interest rates. That's what he's highly confident about. When he got the question today about financial conditions, he showed no concern at all <laughs> about financial easing and making the economy too strong. Uh, I, I thought that was noteworthy because in the past, he's talked about financial conditions a lot as an important uh, way that monetary policy gets, gets transmitted to the real economy. But this time, uh, he did not take the bait on financial conditions easing. And of course, when he doesn't take the bait on financial conditions easing, what does it do? It causes financial conditions to ease more. Bloomberg Opinion columnist and former New York Fed President Bill Dudley there. And that's certainly what we heard from the Fed is what was moving when it comes to Treasuries here. We continue mm. to see this rally uh, gain some traction here in the Asia session. We're down about one basis points further, 458 for your two-year yield. And gold, I mean, continue to hit those all-time highs, right? We're, we're well above that 2200 level now. Uh, and we're watching some of these gold miners, Dowaging Mining, up some 5%. Dave, what else yeah. are you watching? On? Yeah, and on top of this, right, silver is also playing oh, yeah. a bit of catch-up. I think we're near Year one one highs in that pop mart of course raised to buy at jeffries uh there's a really good earnings theme across the region here particularly in greater china we're about halfway through uh the earnings season here and all that being said it's a sea of green out there equities are bid dollar on offer and the bond curve has a shape of a smile <laughs>